Hi, I'm Peter Kamström of Kamström.com Business Solutions. In this demonstration, I will talk about the different types of SharePoint automation. There are lots and lots of different ways to do things in SharePoint and selecting which one is the best for this particular business case is maybe one of the hardest thing to do. So I'll go through the different options and show you some of the pros and cons of each of every one and explain what they are good for and bad for. So let's start with the two major types. First, there's the coding and the no coding. And there are lots of different types underneath each one of them. On my website, the tip section is usually focused on the non-coding versions. But what we do for our customers when we deliver solutions to them, we usually deliver coding solutions because of the trouble with non-coding solutions. We're happy to show customers how to do non-coding solutions if we're going to deliver something that we want to support and that we're able to support and troubleshoot and debug, then we usually do a coding solution. All right, so let's jump into the non-coding versions here. The alerts is the most simple one. Anyone can set an alert on a document library on a list and get email notifications whenever something happens there or a daily summary back with links to the item and a bit of a summary on what happened to that item or the list in total. So it's a really powerful thing and you should really teach yourself and your users what this implies. So that's a really nice way of automation and it covers a lot of basic scenarios. Then we have the content organizer. The content organizer is an old feature that it came in SharePoint 2007 already. And it's built on top of content types. So if you don't know what content types is, this gets a little bit complicated. But in, in essence, it's a way for users to upload documents into one document library. And then the content organizer is a rules engine that automates the sorting of those documents into different document libraries. And it can even move content between sites, which is something in uh, different site collections, which is something that workflows and uh, cannot do. And also it's browser based. So you don't have to download SharePoint Designer. You can do that totally in the browser. So content organizer is a feature that you might want to look into more if that's something that's interesting to you. And we will try to include some demos and text on the content organizer also. Moving on to workflows, which is, of course, the most popular version so far. There are three different types of those. The, they are the built-in workflows. They are also browser-based, just like the content organizer. And there is an approval workflow. There's a three-stage workflow and um, not much else, really. You can't customize those very much. You can set who are the actors who are supposed to be involved in it, but not really much more than that. And also they're deactivated by default. You have to enable those features. So there's some built-in workflows that are browser-based. And then there are the 2010 and 2013 workflows that are built using SharePoint Designer. Technically, the 2010 workflows and the 2013 workflows are very, very different. There are two workflow engines that run these workflows. And the 2010 one is built into SharePoint. So that's running on the same server, technically. The 2013 workflow is based on something called Azure Workflow. So that's running on another server. So there's a communication between those two servers. So that increases the complexity somewhat. And it also allows for some new things like web lookups. You can do API calls, you can do REST calls, and you can also do loops back to SharePoint itself, which is quite powerful. The 2010 version cannot do the loops or has a very hard time doing loops. And also it cannot do web lookups, but it can do permissions management. And that's something that's really powerful when um, you want to set unique permissions. That's something that's difficult to get people to do manually. But if you can do it with a workflow, it gets really powerful. Also, it allows you to do the steps that are running in the permission of the workflow author, not of the person who triggered the workflow. That's also really powerful. All right, moving on. So that's the workflows. Then we have the flow, which is another version of automation. It's really, really powerful. It's running on a different service, not a server really. It's another, another service 
that uh, Microsoft is supplying. And the big thing here is that you can call other services also, other online services, not just inside a SharePoint site, which is the workflow is it's all limited to a SharePoint site. The flow, you can have flows that interact between different site collections and also other online services, even online services that are not Microsoft services, such as Dropbox or Facebook, YouTube, there are a number of different interactions with other online services that you can do. You can also have gateways that allow you to connect to on-premise services. So that's rather powerful. We won't go into that in this set of demonstrations really, but it's something that you should be aware of that it's possible to do. When doing non-coding automation in general, there are a number of problems that you need to be aware of. So I'm gonna expand that section here. There we go. Now we're talking about the problems of non-coding SharePoint automation. Debugging and troubleshooting. When you're building solutions in general, when you're working as a programmer or something like that, a lot of your time is usually spent on debugging and troubleshooting. And in a workflow or a flow, that can't really be done properly. You need to look at error outputs and you need to do step-by-step -step logging, basically a message box decoding. You can't step the code. That's what a uh, professional developer would do. He would step through the code and see what all the variables are and things like that, but that's not possible to do in the non-coding solution. So finding out what's wrong in your non-coding automation it's usually really difficult. So my recommendation is trying to keep it simple to divide and conquer and make lots of small and simple and easy to understand workflows instead of having one big one with lots of different branches and things. So you can call one workflow from another. The difficulty here, of course, is avoiding loops. And also, also there are some things that can only be done with 2010 workflows. So that's something you need to keep in mind when calling one workflow from another. Uh, other problems are documentation. Usually when you're writing non-code SharePoint automation workflows or flows, they are very badly or not at all documented. And that's of course a problem because when the person doing the SharePoint automation quits his job you know, or her job, then if there's no documentation, you presuppose that the next person taking that person's job will have the same knowledge, the same understanding, and uh, that's usually difficult. So keeping it simple is, is one solution for that also, but it's something that you should be aware of, that SharePoint automation with non-coding tools also need to be documented somehow. I recommend doing a video and just talking through what is this doing that could explain it, but keeping it simple is, of course, a solution to that problem also. Another very important problem is deployment. When doing development or automation in general, it's usually recommended that you have one test environment and one production environment. But that relies on that you can easily move the workflow or the automation code from one environment to the other. And that's not a trivial thing to do with none of these actually, with alerts, content organizer workflows or flows. It's, it's always a problem to deploy them. So what usually happens is that people develop their automation solution with non-coding tools in the production environment. So there's no testing environment. And usually that's fine because they're so simple, but once you start building lots of these uh, automation solutions, it becomes a problem. So it's something that you should be aware of. And also if you have these deployment issues, then you might want to look at a coding solution instead of a non-coding one. All right, let's minimize all that and go into the building blocks. Get us in context a bit. So we're still talking about SharePoint automation. We're talking about the non-coding and we're talking about the building blocks of non-coding SharePoint automation uh, solutions. The trigger that starts the automation can be several different types. It can be somebody creates a new item in a list or an, uploads a new document in a library. It can be an edit of some kind of SharePoint content. It can also be started manually. So there we can put out a button that starts the workflow or people can actually find the context menu for workflows and trigger the workflow on a specific item. And it can also be a timer. And these are sorted here in the order of how usual these things are. 
new and edit are, are the most common ones and SharePoint terms of course manual is not so normal and the timer is a bit difficult to get working so I'll have a few demonstrations on that but in this demonstration I just want to show you what types of triggers are available so that's how you start your workflow so in um, the, the second building blocks of a non-coding SharePoint automation solution is the conditions. If you're used to coding, yeah, then you know the if statement is one of the building blocks of all coding. So the condition is the main building block there. You want to check some condition. If the item or the document that you've uploaded fulfills certain specification, then you will do some actions. And that's the next thing. The action is, of course, the reason you're doing the automation in the first place, that you want something to happen. You want a new item to be created in another list. You want something to be logged. You want the permissions to be changed or something like that. Or you want an email to be sent out. You want new tasks to be created. There are lots and lots of different things like that. But the, the actions are, of course, the main building block of a non-coding SharePoint automation solution. And then you have loops. That is when you want to loop through different items and check them or do something with them. And loops are generally difficult to do in non-coding solutions, but they are possible. All right, so that's an overview of those different types of SharePoint automation non-coding solutions. And um, I hope that gave you some insight and we'll dig into the different types further on the website and in the book also, of course. Thank you for watching.